so Richard, there was a third course, you know, you just didn't bother. So I struggled, I struggled at university. I'm, I hesitate to say this, but I, you know, I got a 2-2. Two -two. What did you get, Richard? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a 2-2 two -two in the days when the 2-2 two -two really meant something. <laughs> Grade inflation, it was probably equivalent to a sort of lower first, I would think. <laughs> no. I tried so hard and failed so miserably. So I, I don't know quite what I'm doing here talking about higher education. Um, I just, l listening to the presentation from Southampton, it's a bit daunting actually, you know, looking up here. I remember the Judge Institute built lecture theatres like this, I remember at the very beginning. And I remember doing a session, a case study session on WBP group of students. And in the end, my sort of neck, I think I had a permanent permanent vertebrae damage as a result of it. But um, no, I just listening to the presentation of Southampton reminded me of an experience I had about actually about 10 days ago in Chicago. And I won't say it was at the Business Council, which is, um, there's no sort of real, real body like it. I suppose the International Business Council at uh, Klaus Schwab's um, Davos operation is, uh, is like it. But to the Business Council, it's the sort of mucky mucks. Uh, um, are we on the record here? Is this, or is this Chatham House? <laughs> <laughs> the mucky mucks at, um, in, in America, and um, I won't say which CEO said, I had Nicholas Negroponte from the MIT Media Lab was there. Uh, I asked him to come back because I hadn't seen him for a few years since uh, he got engaged in, Dav in Davos uh, about 10 years ago, heavily into technology. And the, the CEO, I, uh, again, I won't say where he came from, but he said, um, he said basically he was very worried about Young, young kids uh, on, on the web, on the net, because all they did, it seemed to him, was uh, sort of play games, um, you know, sort of uh, war games or whatever it is. And uh, Nicholas, um, not dissimilar to the project that we heard, heard about, the first project that you, you described, um, the, Nicholas described what they had done in Ethiopia with um, iPads. So they took um, a, a bunch of iPads in what looked like pizza boxes. Uh, into a village uh, in Ethiopia. Very, very little, even basic schooling. And they left the, uh, the pizza, they left the iPads in the boxes and came back four weeks later and were absolutely amazed, and he showed this pictorially, um, were absolutely amazed by what these young kids, relatively uneducated, have been able to do, forming groups to explore the applications and downloading various things are quite extraordinary. The, the advanced level that they'd reached within four weeks. And, and it, just listening to the students from Southampton talk about what their, their experience is and just thinking a little bit about what I'm meant to be speaking about today. The title is far better than the material you're about to find, find out. Um, but it, it, really, it really is at the heart of what we're trying to do. And the first thing I want to do is to, to talk a little bit about WPP. Richard mentioned it. We're actually in 110 countries now. We have 163,000 people uh, in 110 countries in one way or another. And um, to talk about, we have four key sort of opportunities, which if you don't do anything about them, they become threats. Uh, but four key opportunities. And the first is what, what Richard, well, two of them, the first two of them are what Richard touched on. Firstly is, is BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China is Jim O'Neill's. Uh, Jim O'Neill claims authorship of BRICS. I think we, we got there first, but... I don't say that too often. Um, but then he certainly cultivated the next 11, uh, I suppose we call it the next 10, because Iran is off limits, certainly to us uh, at the moment. Although, interestingly, not to everybody. If you look very closely at statistics that you see from even some of the biggest global companies in the world. So BRICS and Next 10 are absolutely core. So a third of our $21 billion of revenue, if you include associates, that's companies that we own 20 to 49% of, come from the BRICS and the next 11, essentially Asia, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Central and Eastern Europe. And, and also a third comes from digital, with some overlap between, obviously, the BRICS and next 11, or next 10, uh, and digital. A third comes from digital. So those are the two, two first priorities. Uh, A, to expand our business in the BRICS and next 11, and those faster growing markets, B, to expand it into the faster growing functional areas of our business, not, not felling trees and distributing newsprint uh, in what I would call the legacy media, particularly in newspapers and, and, and publishing and magazines, but really developing uh, search, display advertising, video, uh, social, and last but not least, probably most importantly, mobile. But there are two other objectives. Uh, the third is the application of technology to our business, which is not something that necessarily our competitors have been particularly active about, but we, 
We think that it's very important for us to be agnostic. We manage a, a media book of $72 billion. So $21 billion of revenue in one way or another and $72 billion of media that we invest on behalf of our clients. And we see ourselves as being agnostic but as between the different channels. Google to us is biased. Twitter is biased. Facebook is biased. AOL, Yahoo are, are biased because they're, they're selling their own channel, if I can put it like that. And we have to have we have to have platforms, technological platforms, that differentiate on behalf of our clients in an agnostic way uh, the, the distribution of that $72 billion. And then the last, last um, pillar, if I can call it that, uh, is what we call horizontality. I don't think that actually, maybe that word does exist, but it's, not, it's a particularly ugly word. But what it is, is about getting every one of the 163,000 people to work together. A, a vain hope because it's amazing how uh, creative people are in ensuring that, that organizations don't work together. Uh, you know, I often say, I'm, people say you're CEO of the company, I often say, well, you know, if I go, say go left, they all go right. So I figured out if I really want them to go right, I say go left and they go right. But, but it, it is amazing, and I know I've got some clients in the, in the audience, but it is amazing, and they are all accepted from this uh, generalization. They are the exceptions that prove the rule. But it's amazing uh, how client organizations, indeed our own organizations, manage to defeat either geographically or functionally or through silos uh, the corporate purpose. So that's the background, that's the lens that, that we look at higher education in. And there's another sort of lens that I thought was just worthwhile talking about because I, I, I did just ask how far, I haven't read no stone unturned, the, the, the policy document by Michael Heseltine. Um, I, in fact, when I, I just came back uh, from, from Europe and there was a copy of it on my, my desk, so I know the title at least, and good on titles. And um, I, I, I'd say that because I think the government in the short term have been doing a good job and trying to get some of the economic issues that we face dealt with, and we can disagree about this. People may say austerity is not the right route, but the thing that's been missing has been, in my view, for what it's worth, uh, is the strategic bit. And of course, Michael uh, Heseltine uh, has started to focus, I think, on the core. And part of the strategic bit, and it's a bit, a bit like apple pie and motherhood, but part of it is about, obviously, technology and about infrastructure, both hard and soft. It's not just about runways or new airports. It's about the software. Uh, that we use uh, throughout the country. It's about, uh, obviously, about immigration policy and taxation policy and a fundamental, and lots of other issues, but it's also fundamentally about education. And as I look at our operation, which today has 10% or 12% to be accurate of its business in the UK, 88%, obviously, is outside the UK, and that's where the growth. And, and if I sound a warning note or a worried note, I have to tell you that I am rather worried. I'm worried about where we are economically because of, not so much because of the short term, because I know, I know it's extremely painful uh, and socially unacceptable. I mean, unemployment levels are very high. Uh, certainly when we left university, the issue was not about, about uh, uh, unemployment. The issue was about inflation and, and it was, it was uh, people worried about inflation in relation to unemployment, but, but post-war, unemployment always had the leverage. It was the beverage report that, import, that underlined the importance of maintaining full employment, and the question was, what was the level of inflation that you had at full employment? Today, it's the reverse way around. People say, you know, inflation is the evil, and what's, what do we have to do to main, make sure that inflation is as close to zero as possible? And unemployment, of course, is growing. And if you think we have a problem here with youth unemployment at 15%, whatever the figure is, one in six, whatever, uh, go to Spain, which I will be later this week, and it's 50% uh, against a general unemployment rate of, uh, of 25%. It's obviously socially unacceptable, and education in the structure and the strategy of the government is extremely important. So that's the second lens that I look at this whole area at, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, strategy, and that's something absolutely fundamental. And Michael's report, I understand, covers a little bit, but maybe a little bit uh, not enough 
about what the government should be doing about, about education. Now, I worry about Britain competitively. Uh, I worry about its ability to compete in the international marketplace against not just the traditional competitors, not just the US or continental Europe, but much more importantly what I see going on, for example, uh, in Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Uh, our competitiveness is not as strong as it should be, uh, and the implications for the higher education sector, for HE, are, are obvious. And just a little, little anecdote. So, so um, Hank Paulson arranged for eight CEOs to go to uh, Shanghai, to the China, uh, the Chinese Advanced Leadership Program, CALP, uh, at the Shanghai Management School. It's sort of the Harvard Business School of China, if there is one. So uh, eight CEOs go off with, organized by Hank, and we spend two days uh, with the chairman and CEOs of SASAC. SASAC is the government holding company. It has a uh, turnover, sales, of 2.39 trillion. Uh, it had grown from the last time I looked at SASAC about three years ago from about 1.79 trillion. So this is, this is a big, big, big operation. And we sat with these 40 CEOs. They're all dressed almost exactly the same in sort of short sleeve white shirts and and ties. It was a bit like IBM, but a different sort of I IBM. <laughs> well, IBM it used to be. And um, the Watson IBM, I guess. And uh, they sat for two days. By the way, they don't fall asleep when they listen to boring presentations from CEOs. Uh, they take notes. They're very active. And the most interesting thing was that the chairman and CEOs are compulsorily required to take 110 hours of formal education. If you're the chairman or CEO of SASAC, it could be CNOC or COFCO or Sinopec or CNOC companies like this, China Mobile, uh, Unicom, you are required to take 110 hours of formal education, of which actually our, our two days were, were included. So just a, a little anecdote of what our competition is starting to do. You know the figures on the number of engineers they produce in comparison to the number of engineers we produce. So the, 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 you can go through any of the BRIC countries. Russia, India, and Brazil would be just as good examples of the, of the implications for us in terms of the higher education sec sector and the need for us to compete for talent, uh, for students, for teaching, for infrastructure on a world stage. Uh, and it's possible to see that we might miss out on this, and a, a, a further spiral downwards uh, could occur. And having a world-class, vibrant, and competitive higher education sector is therefore, we think, at WPP, strategically vital to, 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 the, to the country, to Great Britain. And the analogy that uh, the University of Southampton used in relation to the summer is a very good one. Uh, when, you, when you look at what uh, what, what the country was able to achieve in the context of the Olympics, it gives you an idea, and you know, David Brailsford, I remember we invited to our new business seminar just after the, we have a, a sort of monthly new business seminar at WPP in the UK here and other countries for our new business people. And we invited Brailsford after Beijing. You remember the British cycling team did extremely well in Beijing, not as well as eventually they did in London. And I remember him saying that he was going to win the Tour de France uh, in four, four years, I think he said. And I think he did it uh, one year faster than, we all looked at him as though he was, he was crazy. And he described the detail to which he went into. And I won't bore you with all the, the points that he pointed out, but he had a plan, a strategy, and he implemented it effectively. So there's no reason why we can't take, as the University of Southampton did, these sporting parallels in the context of, uh, of uh, education as well. So if you've read the, the excellent report of uh, Tim Wilson uh, in February of 2012, uh, he points out that the international perspective that we have in the UK is sorely lacking. And it's something that uh, we see all the time in our activities in China or India or America or Spain. Uh, and, and something that worries us enormously. I mean, if you look at the pattern of exports of this country, it's still geared to Western Europe. You know, this, this is our biggest trading partner. Whereas if I look at Brazil, you know, take Brazil as an example, pre-Lula, which is what, about nine years ago, 10 years ago, 30% of Brazilian trade was with the United States. Today it's about 12, and the biggest trade partner is, you guessed it, China. <laughs> 
the south-to-south -south pattern of trade is shifting the patterns of trade. And when the prime minister takes a trade delegation to Brazil, you'd be hard pressed, I think, to find Brazil in the top 10 exporting markets for Britain. I think it probably doesn't even get into the top 15. So the whole pattern of thinking that we have as a country is very much geared to, I think, the countries that offer, I'm sorry to say this, but offer slower growth prospects and which, frankly, we are not betting the ranch on at WPP. You know, whatever happens in a worldwide context, we believe that the growth of those BRIC markets, those next 10 markets, Asia, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, Central and Eastern Europe, the prospects are, are far better, and that's where we have to focus, uh, focus our attention. And, and we have very strong, if I look at it in terms of higher education, we have very strong brands here in the UK. I'm, I'm biased, obviously, because of my, my, my history, but, but universities like Oxford or Cambridge or Warwick or Imperial or London School of Economics, whatever it happens to be, and there are many, many others, what happens to be are really strong brands in the education sector which can be expanded abroad, and they will be tempted, I think, increasingly to expand in abroad, just as we've seen in the secondary school sector, you know, a Dulwich or a Harrow or, set or, or schools like that expand in countries like China. Absolutely vital. And one little anecdote also I, I just mentioned. I was talking, uh, I'll be in India next week, and I go to India, I try and go at least once or twice a year, and I see a number of um, what I would call, call the, the Indian oligarchs. And it's really interesting that their ties to the UK educationally have weakened. I would say if I had had these conversations with them 10, 15, 20 years ago, their, their Pavlovian reaction to the question, where do you, would you like your kids to be educated, would be the UK where they would give their philanthropic donations would be to the UK. That has all changed. And I remember, I won't name the, uh, the very successful uh, Indian that I was talking to, but he said, you know, my, my kids are really interested in things American. Whether you like this or not, this is what he said. Things American, American culture, and his kids, if that's not a, an oxymoron, um, his kids, he will send to universities in America, not to traditionally where his parents would have sent them, to the UK. So, th so getting this, breaking that, um, that relationship, I think is a, is a serious issue. And, and if, uh, whilst we'll have some benefits, if the resulting financial returns from expansion uh, abroad for ed higher educational institutions is done, the, the returns will come here. There's also a risk that the center of gravity, the focus will shift uh, east uh, and south unless we do something about it. Because the, the, the po political and social and economic influence is shifting to the, when we, if we think of New York as being the center of the world, to the south, to Latin America, to the southeast, to Africa and the Middle East, and to the east, obviously, to India and China. And in the meantime, we have to have a thriving UK. So how can, how can business help? If this is the background, and I don't want to be de depressing about it because it is a strategic challenge, how can we help? Well, in the old days, you know, when I graduated with Richard in, uh, in 66 from Cambridge, I mean, it was, it was like two worlds. I mean, business didn't, uh, universities didn't want to be tainted by business. You know, the Pavlovian reaction of a, of a first class honors graduate was to go into the civil service or into the universities. It was not to go into industry. Retail was very much the bottom of the heap uh, within industry. And industry really wanted to try and recruit the best possible talent they could for their particular company. And that's the era that Richard and I grew up. It's a slight exaggeration, it's true, because there were companies like Rolls-Royce who were already in that, at that time partnering in. In, in Derby and, 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 and other parts of the, the country, but basically that was the case. There was a separation. Uh, and, and I went to a trade school. Uh, I went to Harvard Business School after Cambridge. I went to trade school, and I really found that in interesting because the, the institution, Harvard Business School, was created by business. In the, in the early part of the, the 20th century, it was created by business, an institution that sprang out of business not out of the church or not out of the state, as traditionally universities uh, had done historically. 
Uh, and the future needs that we, that we need have to be radically different. Uh, we're in the middle of a journey today, and the key words, I think, between for business and education must be mutuality and partnership. And higher education and business can be a very virtuous and mutually supportive uh, ecosystem. Uh, business needs growth, as I've just elaborated, and growth comes from innovation. And innovation needs new research and development, it needs new thinking, it needs new concepts, uh, and it needs new, needs new ways of thinking to be successful. And higher education is a hothouse environment to create this. So especially in areas like science and technology and computing and biotechnology and engineering and nanotechnology, higher education can really help in expanding thinking and expertise. We had our strategy session. I've got John O'Keefe and Peter Dart here. We had our strategy session, top 100 or so people in Silicon Valley about four weeks ago. And it is remarkable when you see the, the uh, interrelationship between the valley and all the educational institutions around it. I mean, they are a sort of, uh, I hesitate to use the word ecosystem uh, again, but they are an ecosystem that works extremely well. We don't have that as well established in the UK as we should, should have. And there are also other opportunities to do it, uh, improve in many other areas, such as medicine, law, business, uh, and other areas too. So partnerships, which I think there should be in this case, can only work when there are two-way partnerships. And business can give so much back. It can clearly give money back. Money is a very big issue in higher education post Lord Brown's Higher Education Review. And I'm delighted to say we managed to help a little bit on that. Uh, but there's only a tenuous link between students' bank balances and their brain power. Some of the best bra brains do not have the financial means to maximize their chances of success. And money is provided by philanthropy, the Said, uh, Oxford, uh, Gates Foundation at Cambridge are good examples of that, or more straightforwardly from business as an investment, uh, and much more can and obviously has to be done. And work experience in internships are another area where business can help enormously. And this is the under the general theme of employability. I mean, one of the, the worst problems we have is a lot of people coming out of universities uh, are not uh, strictly employable. Their, their qualifications are not necessarily geared to what, uh, what people want. And I, I mentioned what employers want. There's an ex unacceptably high level of student unemployment or misemployment, and that's partly because we have very high qualifications but low job specs, and matching them is, extre again, extremely important. And this is linked to the issue of global competitiveness. I just want to give you one little anecdote from our own experience. We, we formed the WPP Fellowship Program, I think, about 14 or 15 years ago. My concern at that time, and I personalize it because I really was passionately keen on this, was that our industry, instead of training people, instead of working with young people, the younger brains, for all these things that I talked about in terms of our strategic development, what we did is we, we nicked people, we steal people. You know, we win a piece of business, we steal people from, from other competitive agencies. And what I wanted to do was to build an interdisciplinary approach, because, because we wanted to get people to work together, I thought that if we had people who were schooled in advertising, in market research, in public relations, and had gone to, say, three different continents. So we did, we, we have a three-year program at the undergraduate level and the postgraduate level uh, to tr develop multifunctional capabilities in multi-geographies. So you might start with JWT here in London in advertising the first year. You go to New York with Ogilvy, Ogilvy One in direct and digital in the second year, and they go to Millwood Brown, say, in China, in Shanghai in the third year. Now, 15 years on, the really interesting thing is I was really worried that our, our competition would copy us. They haven't. There is this sort of, in our industry, the, feel that, uh, the feeling that you really shouldn't train, invest in training, educate, elevate, inspire, motivate. What you should do is just nick and steal. And that, that is something that we tried to counter. And as I say, 15 years on, the really interesting thing is nobody else has really mimicked it. So we've got our fellowship program, and we're completely open-minded, by the way, in the context of that, whether they come from China or Chingford. And the competition is intense, uh, and 
TB, Team GB could do more to increase the employability uh, of these people. And this is a combination of skill and knowledge, uh, of attributes and personality, and a blend of uh, IQ uh, and EQ. And we often see a mismatch between IQ and EQ, and work experience and pay for internships sensibly planned and resourced can do a lot to help. So we'd like to try and develop our fellowship program in a more, more, more significant way. So if this partnership between business and education is to thrive with proper management exchange of ideas, then a, another issue should also improve, which is the mismatch between supply and demand, which at the moment is in certainly uh, put to chance or in the lap of the gods. Where does employment have a need in the UK? Well, uh, a crying need is still in the service sector. You may not like it, but we probably have to breed a new generation of bankers. There is our industry, the advertising and marketing services industry in the UK, which is a world-class industry. We mustn't get uh, arrogant and complacent about it, by the way, but it is world-class. And we have world-class capabilities in design and communications and marketing. Uh, and John Brown, again, is championing the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering because we have a lack of world-class engineers of all types. So why are we not doing more to educate in higher education students who can go through areas and develop, uh, develop capabilities in areas like that where their best chances of employment actually are? And clearly, better information exchange and metrics can only help us achieve that. So finally, we should not overlook the importance of business and higher education working together in terms of the local economy. The key point that is, is that going back to these wonderful establishments that we have here, these wonderful universities, these prestigious universities and, and establishments scattered across the whole of the country, and I know there are many vice chancellors in the audience, uh, and at the same time we have business well distributed in the country as well. And there's some great examples of tremendous cooperation. Boeing in Sheffield, Boots in Nottingham, I've already mentioned Rolls-Royce and Derby, and if there was any hard evidence uh, needed to show how business and universities can work together for mutual advantage, these are very good examples. And it's just what we need, but we need it on 10 times or more the scale. So for all those reasons uh, that I've tried to outline, I, I can't endorse, and WPP as an organization can't endorse more the, the purpose of the role and purpose of CIHE in this country, uh, can't even endorse it more strongly, and emphasize that the time for the development is now. There's an urgent need to do more, as you know, uh, and the, the regenerated attitude towards sport that we heard in the presentation uh, just a few minutes ago is the talking point of 2012 in this country, and one that we must capitalize on and mustn't, mustn't lose. So finally, can I suggest that in 2013 and beyond, we have a major opportunity to do the same for education at all levels, but especially at the higher levels, where the opportunity for collaboration between employers in all sectors, including business, and our superb higher education institutions has never been more timely, never been more necessary in what might be a dangerously low-growth Britain. Thank you very much.